Apple, Google, IDEO, IKEA, Amazon, etc. But we do not have so many cases from India. So what I've done in this book is that I have captured some 30 case studies from organizations ranging from Big Bazaar, Big Basket, Mahindra and Mahindra, Titan, Tanishq, Paytm, etc. on how they are trying to cultivate a approach of problem solving, which is more design thinking later. That's the second takeaway from the book. And the third critical takeaway is to offer a whole host of tool sets, skill sets, and mindsets that anyone should be able to deploy so that he or she can take an idea and scale the idea. What I realized is that the current understanding of design thinking that we have does not pay so much of an emphasis I given a summary mind map. Yeah. This is a mind map of the entire book. And this is a terrible mind map. So someone can just take this piece out and you can stick this anywhere you like. And this is a ready reference for all the skill sets, tool sets, and mindsets that somebody could possibly use. So that's what the book is all about. Uh, the book is uh, primarily intended towards a working executive because they are the people who try to solve problems on a daily basis. But as I, as I believe that anyone who is interested in problem solving would tend to benefit from this particular book. Over to you, Shushma. Yes, sir. So over to Sandeep Das about your latest book. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sushma. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Sony, thank you. I think it was a yes. fantastic uh, introduction about your book and I look forward to reading that. So uh, in terms of uh, why I wrote uh, Hacks for Life and Career a Millennial's Guide to Making It Big. About uh, a few years back, I researched uh, about 250, 300 millennials and 100 corporate leaders. And what came out very clearly is that uh, most corporate leaders said that millennials are not ready to succeed in the workplace. 95% of them are not ready to succeed in the workplace, not ready to succeed in their personal lives. And if you spoke to millennials, they often said that what our aspirations are, what our careers are, what we learn at business school, what we learn at corporates is not in line with what we want to do and not in line with what ground reality is. And hence, this is where the book came in. This The book uh, identified about 70 to 80 hacks in terms of how do we bridge the gap between millennials and corporates so that uh, we make them ready to succeed professionally and personally. So it has many sections. For instance, uh, one of the sections is it demystifies technologies. A lot of talk and a lot of noise around technology. It brings a very simplistic view of what is likely to happen in technology. It, it touches upon the practical aspects of theory. So one of the sections, what I call Gurukul, is that a lot of us read a lot in business school, outside business school, so many textbooks, but essentially you only need 15 or 20 concepts if you can master that's all you will do 80% of the time. So some of those concepts, the book uh, highlights with practical examples. Uh, it has primers on entrepreneurship in terms of how to really get started. What are the mistakes uh, people really make? And what are some of the ground realities you should be aware of? It has a section on personal finance. One of the big uh, gaps that you will see with uh, the system today is people don't know what to do with their own money. Where do they save? How do they save? What are the mistakes you should avoid? So it has sections on personal finance. Uh, it has uh, uh, sections on how do you make successful careers, careers in FMCG, careers in consulting. If you want to pursue on your own through an alternate career, it has uh, sections on that. And it also has sections in terms of maintaining mental health. How do you maintain good mental health? It's going to be one of the biggest uh, issues of this decade. So these are some of the uh, these are some of the hacks which uh, I have covered in the book. It's written in a very uh, entertaining, sarcastic style so that uh, it's easy to read for people and hopefully they'll take back a lot from it. Uh, thank you, Parsoni and Sandeep. Yeah, my next question is like, uh, uh, I think, yeah, to Sandeep Das only. Uh, how do you like, you know, how do you, where do you get ideas from write to book? As, as you have got an idea, like how do you develop an idea to a book? It's like from, you know, ideation to writing a book. So how do you elaborate from an idea to, you know, writing a long book? Yeah. Yeah. So Sushma, that's a great question. You know, and this is where I think our MBA education really helps. So uh, all the three books I've written, what essentially I started off with is I took an Excel sheet and wrote down all the incidents or all the funny things or the interesting anecdotes which I wanted to write. So I just made a long list of 
all the anecdotes, incidents, or the skill gaps, or all the narratives I wanted to do. Then I tried to club those incidents into groups and try to build a sequencing in terms of what should come first, what should come next. After that, I looked at uh, what are the characters I really want to bring about, who should be the lead, who should be the villain. And one of the sessions I also take is uh, storytelling from the world of movies. So a way a movie script is written is fairly, uh, it's like a mathematical script. So in terms of some of those principles, how should be the emotional journey be? Uh, where should you have the spike? Where should you have the cut? So I prepare the skeleton in an Excel sheet. And then uh, what I typically target is, uh, I have a full-fledged job, so it's not easy to write every day, but I target to write about 1,000 words a week. That's about uh, three pages a week I typically do on the weekend. So I take one line in the Excel sheet and I elaborate over a weekend. And it takes about 12 to 18 months to write a script and then you move forward with it. That's what I do. In terms of inspiration for ideas, uh, honestly, a lot of it comes from the real world. Uh, in our day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, like I said, the genesis of my book was a lot of primary research, which I did. Uh, some of my other fiction books in the past uh, has been just day-to-day -day examples. Some of it uh, pure thought, some of it looking at the world of movies. So that's where the inspiration comes from. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep Das. My next question to Do Pavan Soni. I think uh, uh, you are into design thinking from you know this thing. So f to tweak a question a little bit, so I can say the same like you, you are in the design thinking area, but how do you, if you have decided to write on design thinking, then how do you, you know, develop that into a book or, you know, how, what is the process? Like, you know, from an idea to the writing a book, yeah. Sure, it's a good question again. So writing has to be a habit. I think three core habits, which really helped me enormously over all these years is reading, writing and speaking. Now I've been writing since 2005 now, I initially written a blog, uh, I mean, close to 900 articles I have written on various forums and various mediums. So I got into the habit of writing. And then when I was doing my FPM program from I am Bangalore, the amount of reading and writing that one is thrusted to do is so huge that you just can't get away without writing. So we had to write a term paper for every course, every quarter. So by the time you're done with your FPM program, you would have written close to about 30, 35 papers, full length papers. So you get into the habit of writing. Another very critical mental discipline, which I had sort of developed over all these years is whenever I read a book, I have a big library back here. And whenever I read a book, I ensure that I have to write something about the book because that puts additional pressure on me to remember what I've read and to sort of practice it in my workshops or in my writing, et cetera. So I've been writing over last like 16 years now in various magazines, newspapers, blogs, et cetera. And then getting into the book was a very natural culmination. So how it turned out is that somewhere in the month of, um, you know, May, 2019, somebody from Penguin reached out to me and the gentleman asked that, uh, we are looking for a business book in the space of design thinking. Would you be interested in writing a book? Now, how did they spot me? The, the way they spotted me is by reading all the articles which I've written on LinkedIn, Blogger, on various medium, et cetera, social media. And they saw some of my articles and they thought that, hey, this might be a useful person to reach out to. And within one month, I had to send one chapter of the book and about uh, the entire table of content of the book. They took two months to revise it. And they gave me only four months. So I had to write one lakh words in four months. Now writing one lakh words in four months was a very, very non-trivial affair alongside running your own organization. So I somehow kind of borrowed all of that, what I've written in my articles, blog, et cetera, and brought this into the book. And I did write one lakh words till about uh, January, 2020. And then came the pandemic and I was grounded at home. So from August till January, I wrote one lakh words. And from February till August 2020, when the book finally was up for print, I reduced one lakh words to 90,000 words. So the amount of time it took me to reduce 10,000 words was more than the amount of time it took me to write one lakh words. And that's where if you have to write a book, my two cents to all of you would be get into the habit of reading. That's very, very important. Second, get into the habit of writing. It doesn't matter whether people read it so voraciously what you have written down, but getting into the act of writing is very important because writing helps you think clearly. I don't think that you write for others as much as you write for yourself. When you write it down, you start thinking clearly, you start sort of structuring your own thought process, which is very, very important. And third thing is speaking. Now, a lot of speaking has been cut down because of the pandemic, but then 
when you speak to corporate executives they dart questions at you and in your pursuit of responding to those questions you get more clarity on some of these concepts so i think my consulting stint my fpm program at iim bangalore and the habit of writing continuously i mean i used to write a blog every 3 days or 4 days that was the you know speed of or the frequency of writing and all of that came handy when you have to write a book under some stipulated time pressure and it always helps some sort of a deadline to write a book is always useful otherwise writing can be and as sandeep would agree writing is an ongoing exercise you can keep writing endlessly so that's the kind of discipline that helped me write it down sushma thank you paulson yeah my next question to mr sandeep das i uh, you have written a fiction initially right uh, you are sarcastically and the saturn agents and now you moved to the non fiction so uh, any uh, insights on this like why you know fiction to non fiction or uh, just anything you would like to share i can't hear you sandeep sorry yeah sorry i was on uh, i was muted so am i audible now you are audible yes you are yeah. so uh, thanks sushma i think that's a yes. great question one of the one of when i started this writing journey i was uh, fairly clear that each book of mine would do a different genre so when i started your sarcastically it was uh, popular fiction uh, sarcastic take on the lives of modern day people my second book was a crime thriller my third book is uh, a business book so i think that's about uh, exploring yourself and trying to build yourself as a writer so i was conscious that i would try to delve into a different genre with every book so that's the reason uh, i have delved into three completely different genres okay thank you sandeep yeah my next question to pavan soni now for you uh, what can i ask like like how do you uh, people you will be joining and they'll be curious to know how to write start writing your first book it's like that's the you know people will be writing in many places but they always stuck like how to you know start start write your first book so any kind of an insights people who are trying to you know who want to become an author and trying to write yeah absolutely so the first thing is that don't wait for a book to be the outlet for your writing start writing that's very critical start writing now what is the distinction today about writing and 15 20 years back about writing is that 20 years back for you to write something you need to have a platform given to you okay so it was a market where very few people would hold the media but that's no longer true right now if you write high quality content you will be discovered and that's something i have seen with myself that's something that i have seen with many other people you do not have to wait for the right platform or the right opportunity to come to you you need to get into the habit of writing starting today don't wait whether an economic times or a times of india or a mint picks you up they will pick you up gradually they will pick you up because we are whether the world is becoming flat or not i do not know about that but the information is getting truly democratized the media of information sharing is truly getting democratized and the cost of writing an article could have never been as low as it is today all it takes is your time and attention now there are three things that you would need to bear in mind to be a good writer i'm not claiming to be one that's my pursuit but whatever i have learned in my writing career i would like to share with you the first thing is content remains the king with all the contexts and all the contacts that you might be able to bring to the table what you need to bear in mind is you cannot get away by a suboptimal content your content is still very very critical so much so that i strongly believe that even content can supersede the platform in which you are writing if you are writing for a unknown platform but if your content is great i don't think you would be stoppable you would really be getting the audience that you have that's point number 1 content has to be of high quality which would mean that you either borrow the content from your own practice or your research like sandeep went about doing primary research i went about going with my practice and of course the fpm program the phd program at iim bangalore really helped me ground my research and as professor rishikesh krishnan who was my phd advisor always used to say that a good research is one which is both practically relevant and theoretically grounded so conceptually you should be grounded but practically you have to be really really relevant so that's the point number one which is about content spend a lot of time beefing up your content the second point is language now you can either write it 
in a very arcane language, which is not amicable to the common audience. And we, when we were doing the PhD program, we were almost priding ourselves in writing that arcane language. We used to say that if somebody can read your research paper easily, it means it's not a good research paper. But in the practice of management, I think that's a caution that one needs to exercise. So the language has to be very amicable to the audience that you have in your mind. And the third important aspect is the feedback. Write in a channel where you can receive feedback because it is very easy for you to just throw some content out there and expect the world to absorb that content. That may happen, that may not happen. It's very critical that you have some sort of a feedback loop. So to paraphrase, the first thing is content is the king. And I strongly believe that content will be the king. Platform is not the king. It doesn't matter where you write. What matters is what you write. Even if you write a small article in LinkedIn, which is uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, blogs, which you have, you can write on Blogger, you can write on Medium. All these are free of cost. You can write on Facebook. You can have your own blog on WordPress. Don't wait for the book. Book will be a natural culmination of all of the knowledge which you have created, all of the writing skills which you have amicably adopted, and most crucially, the audience which you have gathered. One thing which I've realized, Sushma and Sandeep, and Sandeep would be privy to it, is that writing a book and getting it published is only half the battle. What is equally important, if not more so, is your ability for people to pick it up and start reading it. That's very important because as an author, what you would want is not just to put the book on the shelf, but for you to influence people's mindset. And for me, at least that is very, very critical. That's one of my life's objective is to influence as many people as possible positively. So when you put so much of an effort in writing a book and if people don't read it, you might have a book against your name, but then it doesn't really move the bar. And then they look forward to your book. So I think reading, writing, teaching, and having some sort of an audience base has to be the precursor for you to write a book. And I strongly believe that one book, if you have written a good book in your life, that should be it. One of my favorite authors, uh, Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn gave us this very fantastic word called paradigm shift. Thomas Kuhn in his lifetime wrote one book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And if you go to Google search right now, Google Scholar, this book by Thomas Kuhn, published somewhere in this ever, one book um. in his lifetime he wrote. So the key is that it's not necessary for you to write solid research when you are about to write a book. So that's my perspective, Sushma. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bonson. Uh, my next question to Sandeep. I think uh, the, this question, I think you have answered a little bit, but uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if you want to dig deeper. Like, Do you follow any kind of a routine or, you know, uh, how do you take time for writing from your busy schedule? I know you will, you're working in the corporate and how do you take time? And, and I think it will help a lot of our, you know, uh, alumni to, you know, if you follow any kind of a routine or it's, uh, you know, you just, uh, whenever you get wanted to write, you just get into writing or, you know, like that. Yeah. Do you, you yeah. So to... this is, yeah, uh, this is the question that, that uh, is asked uh, to me the most often because I have had a, I have had a 10 year career in management consulting mm -hmm. and our hours are brutal. So what has worked really well for me is I get up early morning. So I get up at uh, 4.45 every day. I've been uh, doing it for 10 years. And I spend an hour and a half in the morning uh, working on my book or uh, speaking or writing columns. So I think that's what has really worked. Because uh, if you're really serious about this business, uh, just to say I will do it on the weekend is not enough in my view. And at the end of the day, we all are so tired that you can't do it. So in uh, that that's one element of uh, routine I've always followed. That get up in the morning for 45, give it 90 minutes in the morning at your peak intellectual capacity. Over a period of uh, five to 10 years, you will see a lot of traction that is coming through. So that that's one element of routine. The second element of routine is, uh, I think it's very important to have soft targets in your mind that how much output will you produce? So for example, today, I, I have very clear targets that in each month I will write say four opinion pieces for ET or Mint or Times of India, one a week, I definitely target it. So it forces me to think, it forces me to articulate, it forces me to drive. So every person should definitely have that target in their mind. How many opinion pieces or blogs do you want to write? How many words do you want to write? I target thousand words a week. Uh, how many pages, maybe five pages a week. And uh, you should uh, stick to that schedule in terms of target. 
and have a dedicated time. Uh, I think that is what I do in terms of the process. I completely agree with what Dr. Sony said in terms of uh, some of the other points he mentioned that uh, it's very important to keep consistently reading. I would also like to add, it is uh, very important to watch the right kind of Netflix shows because the best form of storytelling is actually what you will learn from a lot of Netflix and Amazon Prime shows. So uh, pick up Breaking Bad, pick up GOT, pick up the last one I saw is Last Dance and you'll be amazed at how much you can learn from these shows. So those, those that that's my uh, input on this. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. The, yeah, the same That's question to Pawan Sony. Yeah. You have, uh, do you follow any kind of a routine or, you know, you just dedicate time between, how do you dedicate time between your, you know, you have a company to, uh, the day to work? Yeah. yeah. So for, first of all, I must congratulate you. Absolutely. I think this is very difficult and having maintained it 10 years, kudos to you, Sandeep. I think that's very, very effective. Uh, for me, what works out is not so much the specific time of the day when I have to write, but the amount of writing that I have to do in a given day. So I have I've made it sure that regardless of whatever is my schedule, whether I'm traveling or I'm in Bangalore or anywhere else in the world, I ensure that I have to read something before I go to bed. That's one discipline which I have made for myself. And in most conditions, I do end up doing so. And I try to read a huge range of things. For example, right now I'm reading psychology. Before that, I was reading spirituality, meditation. So while I write about innovation and creativity, I would like to bring in a lot of perspective. And what helps also is for you to be tremendously focused in the outcome. So what I always advocate to my students is you need to be focused on the outcome, but defocused on the input. Input can come from pretty much anywhere. And as Sandeep rightly said, you can pick it up from watching a movie on the Netflix or a series out there. So input can be from pretty much anywhere, including nature, children, for that matter, anywhere. But the output has to be absolutely focused. Because as you would start writing, you would have temptations of writing on various domains in which you necessarily do not have expertise. For example, politics. I don't have much of an expertise. Or macroeconomics, which Sandeep may have an expertise on, but I definitely do not have. So stick to your knitting when it comes to the output, but be reasonably diffuse when it comes to the input. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to give specific days or specific hours in a day that I have to write in that. But for me, what happens is if I give a target to myself that in a given day, I have to read so many pages and I have to write it down, that helps me enormously. So that's the distinction between our approaches that I unfortunately do not have a specific time of the day when I write down. I'm not an early morning person like Sandeep, something which I'm not uh, happy about also. But then what helps me enormously is to at least ensure that in a given day, this is the amount of reading, writing and teaching that I have to do so that I can sleep peacefully. So that helps. Thank you, Sandeep. Yeah, my next question to Sandeep Das, uh, it's like, um, do you have do you have any illustrations in your book? Like, you know, uh, what is the role of illustrations in a nonfiction? Do you recommend going for any illustrators or, you know, yeah. How do you, do you believe yeah. in doing it yourself? Yeah. No, I think uh, again, Sushma, that's a great question. I have a, a lot of illustrations. See, in a business book, these matter a lot, not so much in a fiction book. So for instance, one of the chapters I had is how to write a movie script. And the best way you have to show it is you, on the x-axis, you have to show time. On the right axis, you have to show emotion. And then you show a curb. And I think those are illustrations that my book brought in. I think my book had close to 50, 60 illustrations because it becomes easy to read uh, for people. And also uh, visual input is far more effective than textual input. You will know this. We all are part of an educational institution. You, once you show a good visual, that uh, people somehow remember that no matter how many pages you write. And I think for all uh, budding authors who are listening to this podcast, even when you want to write for leading magazines like ET or Mint, even when I write, the first thing the editor always asks me is, uh, please make a visual and send it to me because it brings in clarity of thought. It uh, brings in attractiveness and it brings in end user attraction. So it is supremely critical. 
and uh, i know a lot of people what they do is first they make the visual and then they write the chapter they do it that way also so it is extremely important whether you're writing a book whether you're writing an opinion piece or even potentially giving out a speech so uh, uh, thanks for that yeah and even in fiction you have you had a illustrate illustration as it in earlier books as well no no so not really. uh, hey, no, i yeah. no, not really but uh, i i also think the reason i did not have it is maybe i never realized it could be done it's not so much because i, I can know. stand and say no no the script need didn't need it all that but maybe i did not need it so maybe the next book i write even if it's fiction maybe i will consider it because what happens uh, sushma is when you have a series of illustrations it starts looking like a movie script it starts looking like movie lenses and then okay. the readability of the book goes up a lot so maybe even for fiction people should explore that okay thank you sandeep yeah my same question to pavan soni yeah do you have a, you do you believe in having a illustrations and how 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 do you you know do the do that in your book yeah So I'm a great fan of mind mapping and Venn diagrams. Uh, both of these models, mind mapping and Venn diagrams, first of all help you structure your own thinking, and they help you tremendously because when you are trying to write a chapter, you need to be able to reduce it to the bare essence as to what is the key takeaway that you would like to cover. Uh, but too many illustrations is something that I have avoided, uh, and that's also been advised to me by my editor and my publisher Penguin. that too many illustrations might not be useful so roughly about two illustrations per chapter so i have about 10 chapters in the book but what really helps bring the element of design into my book so for example if you have to have some sort of a flow chart value stream mapping some diagrams visual representations two by twos and that's also something which i have read in management philosophy for example and as sandeep would agree that one of the most remembered hierarchy of needs and the way we remember the maslow's hierarchy of needs is in the form of a pyramid similarly if i look at the work of philosophy one of the most recognized works in philosophy is by this gentleman by the name mihail chiksas mihaili from the chicago university and that's where the flow diagram axis is you have the skill so what i realize is that when people do not remember the content of your book they might remember the figures in your book or the illustrations in your book and the key is that these illustrations will be so simple and so sticky and the most simple and sticky illustrations are invariably either your venn diagrams the three circle venn diagram or a simple mind map so i try to reduce it to those sticky figures which if they remember if they remember just that venn diagram they should be pretty much able to recall whatever was written in that particular chapter so that's been my pursuit in using selectively the uh, illustrations thank you ponson yeah my next question to sandeep das i think it's the question of most of the authors like you know first time authors like how uh, how do you get your books published like you know does the brand value of the publishing house matters or you know initially should you go for a self publishing yeah so can you just share your insights on this yeah yeah i'll actually record what uh, pavan said some time back the real challenge starts once you write the book the easy part of the journey is to actually write the book now for first time authors uh, to be realistic uh, so so let's start with the publishing medium and then we'll get into which is so how do you look at the publishing medium in india so one you have the tier one publishers uh, penguin sage harper collins etc then you have some of the tier 2 indian publishers and then let's say you have uh, the self publishing route so let's really look at what are the pros and cons of uh, each of these uh, publishing vehicles so if you look at the tier 1 it uh, uh, comes with a certain amount of brand they have very good uh, they'll do visuals they'll do covers a certain amount of distribution muscle so these are benefits of tier 1 uh, they will obviously they might not give you the best of margins in terms of royalty but they give a certain amount of traction comes with a tier 1 publisher Now, if you look at a tier two publisher, some of the Indian houses like uh, Srishti, uh, etc., they uh, what they give you is they give you a little more attention, but they might not have the brand and the distribution strength of say what a, a PRH or a Penguin Random House might have. Now, you look at self publishing, and the way self publishing works is basically on Amazon, you put up a Kindle or through Clear Space, you put up your hard copy. 
you make tremendous money. So royalties uh, for a tier one or tier two publishers would be lead to 10% for a self-publisher goes nearly from 50 to 70%. But uh, because of self-publishing, some of the distribution strength might not be there and you have to do the whole marketing for yourself. Historically, what has also happened is there's been a certain amount of taboo associated with self-publishing that you could not get a mainstream publisher and hence you had to go through a self-publisher. But I think that has gone over a period of time. Some of the international bestsellers you see have all been uh, self-published. Amish Tripathi's first book was self-published and uh, Bestland decided to pick it up. So there are three mediums, right? tier one, tier two, and self-publishing broadly. What I suggest for new authors is, uh, is follows. You should uh, approach all the tier one and the tier two publishers. Uh, it is difficult for a new author uh, to get a tier one publisher. It generally, it doesn't work unless you come with a very specific background. In generally, it doesn't happen. So you should try for a tier one or a tier two publisher. Uh, generally, take uh, what you get. Or else, if you're not happy with what the publishing house is offering, you might want to even do self-publishing. So this is in terms of uh, choosing the publisher. Now, there are ways to reach out a publisher. So you can, there's something called an agent. In the in the US, you will see the agent concept is very powerful. So you go to an agent, he cleans up your script, he edits your script, and then he pitches your book uh, to the publisher. So you can either choose to go to the publisher through an agent or without an agent. In my experience, the agent scene in India is uh, not very mature. And I think there are more thugs for lack of a better word than more quality agents compared to the us where agent scene is very mature so i would suggest uh, you stay off agents not to say they're not good agents in india they are but i would strongly suggest you stay off agents to give you some idea of timeline so that all of you should be realistic uh, i think what dr sony said in terms of his timelines are uh, to be honest a best case and maybe he's an established professional that's why it went so fast uh, what happens in a in, especially in fiction, nonfiction goes much faster. In fiction, once you sign the contract with a publisher, it will take you 15 to 18 months to see the book into the market. Business goes a lot faster. Uh, in my case, it was six to nine months, his was four months. Business is less than a year, you should assume, but uh, fiction, you should definitely assume a year and a half. So uh, these are the points. And I should also add that it's a very difficult journey for an author. You should not be under any illusion. So while the publisher might support you in distribution, will support you in branding, will support you in marketing, at the end of the day, the entire onus of the book success, 80% of the book success will come on your individual brand, how strong you are in social media, uh, how, what is your professional standing, how do you do your marketing plan? 80% of that eventually comes to that. There is only so much support uh, a publishing house can give you. So, yeah. yeah thank you, Sandeep. Yeah, my next question is the same question That's to Pavan Sony. Yeah. How do you get your book published? But in your case, I think Penguin approached you, but yeah, is there anything uh, you would like to share on this? Yeah. own personal reputation. So for me, uh, the priority was definitely not money. Because I knew for a fact that when I put my book out to my consulting clients, I'm going to get multiple fold business. So it was a virtuous loop for me. Every consulting project which I do, every workshop which I do, I give my books to my participants. And then this in turn gets me more business. So royalty was never a concern for me. Uh, it doesn't remain so because the amount of money that I might get on royalty will dwarf as against what I would get from a consulting. Now, when you run consulting setup, having is very, very critical that can make or break your consulting career pretty much. Uh, and so must be the case in researchers. So when you are teaching at an institution, the amount of A-level publication that you would have is going to make or break your career and get you into a tenure track. So basically your career, whether you're a working professional, independent consultant, entrepreneur, or a faculty, this is the kind of profession that choices that you have made. You have to choose your outlet very carefully. And when I was doing my FPM program research in a tier one journal, and then I do, did this mental calculation that the amount of effort that I'm going to put in publishing into, a uh, I know uh, SMJ, which is a uh, you know, strategic management journal or a AMJ, Academy of Management Journal, that same amount of effort I can possibly put in publishing a full-length book. 
and if i get huge amount of time so i would always want one to reflect on the career choices that the person has made and then choose the outfit very carefully whether it is about popular media it's about a tier one publisher it's about research outlets and all three are equally good in my opinion coming down to the choice of publishers again sandeep nailed it this year it's a trade off between your brand and the brand of the publisher till the time you establish your own brand you have to piggy back on some other brand now whom do you piggy back on either piggy back on i am bangalore's brand or you piggy back on uh, Keep back on, and then you establish your brand. Today, Barack Obama writes a book, which he did. It doesn't really matter who is the publisher. It doesn't matter because he is Barack Obama. But what you need to always do is that don't be mistaken, and that's something I've realized. Don't be mistaken because it win. People will be up. Don't be mistaken on that. If the book has good content, and only if you are voraciously pushing the book on the social media you have to do it day in and day out and i remember uh, my wife keeps telling me this story about tom cruise who for a very long time was her favorite actor tom cruise whenever he makes a movie he is the one who is marketing the movie even though he is getting a fair cut of whatever fee he has but he takes a personal obligation to market the movie he does road shows for his own movies mission impossible and whatever movie tom cruise makes same thing you have to do as an author it doesn't matter whether your book is self published or published by penguin or published by anybody else you have to be the face of the book and not penguin and you have to leave no stone unturned in marketing your book that's very very important so i don't want a moral hazard to come into you just because you got a good publisher it should not lead you to pedal back on your own marketing and evangelism effort that goes without saying so that's been my experience that's important yeah uh, sushma can i add a couple of points sure sure yeah go yeah. ahead yeah. see i think uh, uh, dr soni was referring to a couple of points but i think he was very diplomatic in his language let me be absolutely <laughs> blunt you you have to be shameless on social media doing pr please understand uh, there is uh, if you really want to make a name in this industry you have to go to everybody and say buy my book so i am telling you after this call go to amazon look for sandeep das look for hacks for life and career and buy my book and i think that is the level of uh, some people call it desire some people call it shamelessness you need to have to succeed uh, in this industry just because you write a good book it doesn't mean the book will sell you need uh, the good book actually honestly a lot of people in india write but the real difference in my view is the pr and the brand you establish that's that's point 1 so be selfish uh, be selfish so for example i'll i'll give you i was not very active on linkedin and uh, till uh, about the end of 2019 i had only 2000 connections which is very poor on linkedin but i decided that if i had to make a name in social media i had to uh, be very strong on linkedin so today i have 10000 connections and that's still not good but i've moved a lot and that has meant i have shared the right kind of content i have the right frequency of sharing i reach out to important people and i openly go and be shameless in terms of pr so Uh, one thing you have to say is this is not the profession to be dignified and respectful you have to go and literally win highball by highball that that's point 1 a second point i wanted to touch is again what dr soni touched that uh, you have to understand what a book does a book will not make you money so uh, my book is uh, uh, touch what considered to be a big success will do about 25000 copies but i make 50 rupees a copy now do 25000 into 50 and you cannot survive one month or six months paying your emi in bombay so book will not give you much but what the book will give you is the speaking opportunities what he was referring to whether it is speaking at corporates whether it's speaking at business schools and that is when you will really make your money so you should know what the book's objective is it will give you a brand but the real money you will make as an individual is always through speaking it is never through writing so even uh, i'll give you an example i i, I wrote a piece with amish tripathi uh, to uh, two months back and amish tripathi has made a lot of money through writing he's made potentially 8 to 10 crores but even he believes that writing is not good enough and now he's doing a job at london because he wants to supplement his writing income so writing on its own will not 
let you pay your EMI for two months. You have to build speaking, and that is where the real money is. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. Yeah. My next question uh, to yeah, Pawan Soni. I think uh, how are the writing has you know changed yourself or you know looking at different things. Earlier, you would be uh, you know your perspectives would have changed. So how actually the writing has changed you as a person, you know, as a reader, as a writer. Yeah. Would you like to share your? Yeah, so writing this book has been sort of a natural culmination to the writing journey. It was sort of came naturally. But I think writing for me is quite meditative. What helps me is that when I read so much, when I read so many books, it's very critical that you have to have an outlet for you to kind of intellectually structure your thinking. I distinctly remember when I first started writing, and I was at Niti Mumbai in 2003. So 2003 is when I started. I had spelling mistakes, blatant spelling mistakes in my The sentence, grammar, some of those things were not really, because I don't come from my English speaking belt. I come from a Hindi speaking belt. I come from North India. Some of those natural like you never there writing. And I didn't obviously have any audience. But over a period of time, once you start putting the pressure back on you, that you need to reach out to people, that's where it really helps you. And then the feedback loop that I was referring to. If you write well, you get consulting opportunities, you get speaking opportunities, and then it kind of gives you more content to write back on. So writing, and there are three core skills. If I were to sort of communicate to my audience, the three core skills that one needs to hone. The first skill is good listening skills. You need to be a very, very good listener. Because the inordinate amount of the content that will go into your writing will not necessarily come from your reading, but will come from your listening. Listen to questions. Like in today's uh, session, I can almost write a small blog about the key points that Sandeep had written down or that, has, that he has spoken, which complements my thinking process. I'm a nonfiction reader and a nonfiction writer, and he also doubles up as fiction and nonfiction. That's the listening skill. The second is reading skill. And I always maintain that read with the intent of teaching it to somebody. Don't read for the intent of reading. Read with the intent of teaching. Because when I read something and I know that I will teach it to somebody the very next day or the very next moment I have, then what I do is I make a mind map behind the book. Of the entire book, I can summarize in one single you know, A5 mind map. And then I ensure that I pick up some of the salient points on the book and I teach it. So good listening good reading. And the third thing is good writing. Start writing it down. So I think uh, the book has only been a sort of reaffirmation of some of the beliefs which I've had for all those years. But I do not think that, honestly speaking, I do not think that the book per se was something that I was looking forward to, or the book has sort of given me a reason to read, write, and teach. And I'm sure I'll continue to read, write, and teach Book was just one of the sort of milestones, if I may uh, say so. So that's been my view, Shushma. Yeah. Same question to Sandeep. How so I think what uh, writing has taught me, at least, is a sense of patience. Uh, I think my listening ability has definitely gone up because, uh, to be honest, when your boss is screaming at you, you're actually thinking you to yourself, you have no idea what I'm going to do to you in my next book. So you are actually waiting, you're watching his hand movement, you're watching his eye movement and he's screaming away and you're not replying. And it gives a certain amount of sadistic joy in those kind of situations. So definitely I think patience levels uh, go up. That is one. The second thing it has taught me is actually a lot of storytelling. I, I come where I interact with a lot of, I'm in strategy consulting, I interact with a lot of CXOs. And a lot of, uh, so someone asked a question, what sort of shows do you see? So uh, some of the shows I started off with, I went and saw all of Christopher Nolan's movies and I saw them again and again and again, not as an audience member, but in terms of if I had to write the Batman series, could I have written that series like that? So those are some elements of uh, storytelling, which uh, writing has definitely taught me. So for all of you who are listening here, I strongly advocate uh, the series I spoke of earlier was uh, called The Last Dance. 
it's a sports documentary on uh, Michael Jordan and how he won six titles with the Chicago Bulls in the 90s. It's a brilliant series. Please see it. Uh, watch all of Christopher Nolan's movies, especially the uh, the Batman trilogy. I think they are excellent stories that uh, are clearly said. Watch a lot of biographies. Uh, I think they're really good. So the Steve Jobs movie, I really like. And in terms of series, I think uh, any series that is a crime thriller is an excellent uh, way to learn. So watch something like How to Get Away with Murder. You will actually learn storytelling with it. So one, writing taught me a lot of patience. Two, uh, I think taught me a lot of storytelling. I think the third one was more psychological, that it gives you an identity outside work. What happens is uh, a lot of us might think Sandeep Das is designation A for this company B. And over a period of time, that starts to ring hollow. You know, you just can't be a designation A person, B or being C. So I think writing gives you that extra spark in your life where you think you are doing something for yourself, something a little more. To give you an example, uh, the day this book came and got printed, the kick you will get from seeing that, honestly, uh, not even a BMW can match that kick. So it's a different kind of kick you get in life. It gives you a different kind of identity. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. My next question to you, Sandeep. The thing is, yeah, now, yeah. where do you see, you know, the role of e-books or the Kindle in India? Do you see, but I, I, I was just reading an article, they say in US and UK, it's, you know, it's picked up well and it's quite popular. But in India, it's still not up to, you know, uh, some says like it might pick up, like and how e-commerce picked up. So do you have any insights, you know, people who want yeah, yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the insights. I was looking at my book's numbers. See, e-books in India used to be less than about 5% till, uh, till say, the COVID struck. Now, my current book sales, I was saying, I think close to 40% is coming from Kindle because during the pandemic, people were so scared of getting the physical copy, they just kept ordering on Kindle. So I think Kindle, so 40% of my sales of the current book has come from Kindle and 60% has been the physical uh, copy. So Kindle will definitely pick up. Uh, I think uh, over a period of time, if today is 5%, I think Kindle will stabilize around 15 to 20%. Ebooks will stabilize around uh, that number of 15 to 20%. Also, uh, with more and more youngsters, Gen Z coming in, they are far more comfortable with the Kindle, say, what you and I were. We somehow, you know, slightly are old school. We prefer that smell of the page and uh, the books should be in that bookshelf. I, I think some of us are old school, but the new generation, I think, doesn't have all that. So I think over a period of time, you might see Kindle hitting 30% of uh, total sales. How and Sonia, your uh, take on this role of ebooks or the thing in India? It's penetrating. Yeah, I second. I second Sandeep. It's going to be a big thing because, for example, today if I have to give books to my participants, I was just taking a course at I am Rohtak uh, last week, and uh, all the students had to refer to the book, and there was no way that I can reach out to I am Rohtak students who are spread across the country in the pandemic with a physical book. However much I would like to sign a book and give it to them, Kindle seems to be the only way forward. So there is no other way that I can possibly look at. So that's, and that is rightly so. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Kindle. It, it makes sense. It's a win-win for every party. It's a win for the industry, which doesn't have to print a book. It's a win for the consumer, doesn't have to carry a physical book. And it's a win for the author, because as Sandeep would agree, it gives you a better margins in the royalty. <laughs> Someone is doing PR for your book. <laughs> yeah, <it's my> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we are we are already eleven thirty. Do you, uh, can we take a little more time? Maybe another 10, 15 minutes. For yeah, yeah, minutes. Is, is it okay, Pawan yeah. and Sandeep? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah please okay. go ahead. I think my yeah my last question is like, uh, has IMB been any part of your journey as author? Played any important role? Would you like to share or any uh, advice to the authors you know who wants to write and you know publish their book? Yeah, to Sandeep. Yeah. See, I should not be saying this. In my first book, uh, some of the joker type incidents actually came from some of my batchmates. So that way, IMB was obviously helpful. But on a on a, on a more serious note, uh, I think the institute gives you a certain brand. So uh, I, I don't think, to be honest, the institute helped me in my book writing. But in a lot of my column writing, Economic Times, Fortune, Mint, a certain amount of credibility comes uh, with the institute. A certain uh, The speaking assignments, for sure, the business column writing. 
pure books i i honestly think it's a bit of a disadvantage uh, what happens is when you go to a top editor or a top publisher and he'll be like oh there is one more i am guy who's come written one more book <laughs> i think i think that is actually a bit of a disadvantage so if you if you are actually a you know english literature student or a journalism student and if you go to a top editor there's a better chance you will get traction if you say i am abc and they think chetan bhagat amish tripathi and they think oh my god one more wannabe has come and they just put it in the trash pile so the absolute book writing i am not sure uh, the business column writing the speaking i mean it has done a phenomenal amount thank you sandeep thank you yeah over to pavan sonia you are how I imd has been yeah enormously enormously i must say that the first thing is that the fpm program the fpm program put us tremendous amount of discipline and endurance in reading we have to almost read like 300 pages per week when you are reading 300 pages per week and then not just read read with comprehension write down the reviews and read those articles thick research articles and books you get into the habit of reading fast reading with a lot of accuracy and more importantly you get into the habit of writing i don't think had i not gone to the fpm program at imb i would have been half the author that i i want to that i envisage to be today that's point number 1 and the point number 2 is that when i was in that space of imb and when you get a phd kind of a program it gives you a lot of legitimacy legitimacy not only because of your you know publisher that you are authoring but legitimacy in your corporate context and contents and that's where you are able to strike conversations with people for example when i reach out to kiran majumdar shah or the former isro chief or mr r a mathukar etc when you have that kind of a legitimacy that you are a phd from i am bangalore people start taking you a lot more seriously especially if you are writing a research back book so i think imb has been instrumental in me writing this book up it's been very very key for me at least and i don't see any disadvantage that i can think of right now are coming from that association Okay. Thank you, Pawan Sir. I think yeah, uh, uh, we are. I'm done with the questions. I let's open to Q and A. Uh, yeah, I think participants, you can type the questions in chat window. Meanwhile, actually, we have floated a form. Uh, you know, while sending our mailers, like if the question, if they have any questions. So I have few questions from them. So let me ask you before the participants ask any questions. Sure. Yeah, I think yeah. Over to Sandeep Das. The question is. what according to you are your failures and how did you manage them or overcome or convert them to success yeah so uh, I, I, so in a corporate career or in a writing career you will have many many failures so one of the big uh, mindset shifts that will be required as all of you come into the workplace and make a difficult alternate career is that 80% of the time you will fail let me give you an uh, instance i always wanted to uh, start writing for the economic times so from 2014 i i think have approached every editor of et every week uh, so i would have made i think 250 calls and all 250 would have rejected me and 2019 end is the first time et reached out to me and said why don't you start writing for us so and this is normal i'm not saying this is some glamorized story this is normal so this is what typically happens so there is uh, this is uh, fairly common in terms of these kind of careers that uh, i'll give you another instance i have been doing this for 10 years now and this is how typically success looks like and the first 8 years uh, despite getting up you know 445 every day you don't i didn't have much to show yes i had a couple of books but they were going up going down and the ecosystem wasn't firing uh, the real success for me actually came in year 9 and year 10 and that is when everything got made up at one go some some ridiculous amount happened in the last year so i think when you make careers like this you should uh, uh, think of it as a movie star's career or sportsman's career that the first 80% of the journey you will fail and you need to have that desire or that belief that um, for some reason i had this incredible cocky feeling in my mind that mai to succeed karunga how can i fail and i kept going and going and going and some day i think i faked it and it somehow worked out so i think that is uh, the big uh, that is what i would suggest uh to pavan sony yeah one of the uh, member have asked like have you applied design thinking as a way of life if so kindly share your personal incident <laughs> yeah so if i can i can identify three core tenets of design thinking the first is empathy how do you empathize with people 
and i think uh, this entire book writing expedition and the workshops and the reading that i did with it enabled me to be a slightly more empathetic person that's the first thing which i'm trying to apply in my life i'm trying to be more empathetic more emotionally intelligent the second thing is be more tolerant be more tolerant towards ambiguity what happens when we are in an mba institution we often look for predictability we scout for you know uh, assurance but the world outside is so chaotic that anything that you look out in terms of predictability only disappoints you so your comfort with ambiguity is the second thing the third thing is iteration i remember the final book when it comes out it has been it has gone through 75 iterations 75 times i had to revise the book before i had sent it out and this 75 iterations i could only manage because i was comfortable with ambiguity so i've tried to use design thinking but it's an ongoing journey for me so iterative thinking comfort with ambiguity and third thing is greater empathy towards people is something which i have tried to apply in my life and i i feel that others can also do so and they'll benefit from it thank you thank you for i uh, actually now... like pavan's daughter patting him for that answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah now question from ashwin i think in the chat i can see what tools do you use to organize and connect your thoughts question for it's for both sandeep and das sandeep and pavan can you, uh, yeah sandeep, i want actually to yeah i actually like i said when i start the book i obviously go the route we are familiar with take an excel break it down then start writing but uh, simple things like i obviously have a notes app so whenever i get a good idea i just type it down even if i am not around my system i have uh, once i tried to do uh, i think a version of the mind map which pavan had said uh, in terms of uh, what is the central theme what are the three sub ideas then you keep breaking it down and i tried to do it on a chart paper and i think it was fairly useful so in my mind definitely excel having the notes app Uh, are are the most important. Yeah, Next yeah. Two yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ashwin, first of all, thanks for joining in. Ashwin is a dear friend of mine from my Vipro days. So thank, thank you, Ashwin, you. for joining in and asking this very interesting question. Coming down to the tools, I'm a I'm a fan of writing it down with hand. Uh, not so much uh, technology, but I always write it down. So I have a big whiteboard in front of my work desk where I typically write down my thoughts. Plus, maintaining a notebook. and having mind mapping mind mapping for a very very long time now almost for the last 15 years that i've been using this tool both electronic mind mapping i use a tool called mind map free mind and then there is another thing called mind map which i use but then even physically drawing mind map gives you a lot of clarity so i think physically structuring your thinking and electronically drawing those has been very useful to me but beyond that ashwin i think this is the most critical tool that we use you have to really be able to chew in a lot of data assimilate it and get to the habit of writing the iterative writing so as i told you like 75 iterations i have to go through my book before the penguin said okay let's go ahead with that and then another few rounds before it hit the marketplace so i think being able to iterate it over and over again it's very critical thank you pavan yeah uh, next question from manisha to sandeep what motivates you to write constantly yeah Yeah I think uh, this is an individual call I always uh, was very interested in speaking and writing even during my B school days I am days and it is also about uh, creating a different career in terms of a secondary career it gives you a certain amount of joy it gives you a certain amount of traction and what I've also seen is the benefit from the secondary career helps my primary career people know you do something else you automatically stand out you certain have certain storytelling skill set so Uh, i think what motivates you constantly should be that desire uh, you should when people start this journey they should tell themselves that i'm going to do this for 30 years uh, you should say that i'm going to do this for 30 years week after week after week the way you look at your corporate career and uh, over a period of time things work out this is not a short term option if you're looking to get in and this is definitely not for the faint hearted so that that is the motivation true thank you sandeep uh Yeah, my next question is to Mr. Pawan Soni. Uh, I think one of the person Vikas have asked in the online form. He has asked like, as compared to developed countries, where do we stand in design thinking? Yeah, it's a good question. So one thing which I would like to offer to all of you is that Indians are creative. 
let's accept that we are creative there is no doubt about that and the sheer creativity that if you have to look for indians you have to log, watch the tech talk the videos that go all around us so that shows amount of creativity but where indians can benefit from tremendously is to be more disciplined so what design thinking has brought to prominence and what i try to bring from this particular book is a sense of discipline if we can be slightly more disciplined i don't think there is any comparison that i would like to do between the western world or the advanced countries and us it all reduces to discipline and i don't think that discipline has to do anything with the population or even to that extent education uh, you can choose to be disciplined any time of your life so that's my view on us versus them thank you pavan soni uh yeah. Uh, sorry, Sushma, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, uh, I was. Partha has a question. Yeah. Sorry. I think you Partha face... wrote a question down. Yeah, the Partha. Yeah. Did you face the writer's block with respect to ideas, or how how you are taking contents is evolving? Should I take this question, Partha? Yeah. So that. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandeep. Please go ahead since you started. Yeah. yeah so uh, yes i think the writers block happens so this is where that discipline is very important uh, at least i tell myself i have to write three pages a week i have to do one opinion piece i have to do this i uh, i even tell myself i have to watch one drama movie and four netflix episodes i think that discipline really helps the second thing where when i'm stuck is uh, i actually go out for a run and when you go out for a run amidst nature somehow you will see the content starts flowing in there is clarity the junk goes out of your mind so i think that's how i at least overcome uh, overcome this uh, writer's block and uh, whatever ideas i get i just keep writing down i keep writing down in the phone i carry and over a period of time that content evolves into something more tangible absolutely true that's true that's true i'll agree with him on this yeah. uh, the only thing is that uh, you need to think of your life as a portfolio of careers so if you have a writers block in writing you go and teach you go and speak you go and read and when you come back to your writing expedition you are perhaps far more creative so that straddling if you can do you would not be fixated because if you are only a writer then you might be you know stuck somewhere but if you are a writer plus so many other things and you can straddle between them and come back with fresh thoughts so that's been my approach thank you paul uh, next question is like on the online we have got from chauhan how can we democratize and develop the learning mindset so as to enable thriving businesses in the new world order i don't know whom he has asked <laughs> dr soni you should take this <laughs> <laughs> i'm used to these questions so let me take it up uh, so this is a quite a laden question i do not know Uh, if my answer would be appropriate but the only thing which i can offer to you is that think of learning as a continuous process okay and today thanks to the internet and thanks to the gig economy that we are in and the mooc that is available to us you can read at next to nothing cost throughout your life uh, so with the democratization of information you can read more and more important you can even contribute more so if you are wanting to become a better author i think reading and writing have to be the core skills that you would have to develop yeah i, I will just add, have... yeah go ahead please yeah i'll just add one point to that watching is also very critical watch uh, watch a lot of movies watch a lot of series i think that's how you really democratize content also uh we are already 11 i think with time is 11:42 we should pause yes yes okay my last thing is like if you you know you can talk, talk about your book again you know if you want to mention i had already put the links in the chat if you both of you want you know just uh, about your book and you know uh, kind of yeah yeah, yeah there's not to much to be said there's not much to be said please go to amazon look for sandeep das looks for hacks for life and career and buy the book there's not much to be said other than that so yeah Okay. Yeah. yeah. Pavan Soni, would you like to, you know, yeah. Yeah, daughter. my daughter has done the same, so I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have actually to all the participants, I have given the links of both the authors' books in the chat. 
so uh, we we encourage you to go to the you know amazon links and buy the books and leave a review on amazon yeah yeah and thanks I to partha before i before i yeah. you know missed thanks to partha is a very good friend and accomplished author himself and yeah. the head of elemena association uh, thanks yeah. partha for giving me this opportunity and thanks sushma for a wonderful set of questions i really appreciate Thank it you. and thanks Thank andeep i learned a lot this morning from you and i hope like you i am also able to write more than one book <laughs> thank you thank you everyone thank you sushma thank you partha thank you dr soni for this opportunity i think uh, i i genuinely think it's very good when your alma mater goes out of its way to support uh, authors like us uh, they they are doing a lot more than they should so a uh, big thank you it's not the first time partha has done something for me so partha thank you again and thank you sushma again thank, thank you, you so uh, thank, thank you sandeep and pavan soni yeah for taking your time i know on the saturday morning it would be quite difficult for both of you and it's really nice having you on this session i'm sure our participants would have a lot of takeaways and i'm sure there'll be it will help them you know to in the journey of becoming an author or writing as well you know yeah thank you thank you again okay. thank you sandeep thank you so and much. pavan take care, and to all participants yeah take take thank care you. Bye. thank you bye bye bye, bye. yeah